perturbation theory is another theory of the acoustics of speech production. Perturbation theory makes predictions about how changing an articulation, for example, by co-articulation, would affect formant frequencies. The predictions of perturbation theory um, are based on what's called the volume velocity function of the standing wave in a half open tube. So as a basis um, for predictions about uh, speech acoustics, it starts with the same type of model as our other tube models do, the half open tube that's closed at the larynx and open at the lips. Um, but then it looks at how a standing wave in that tube would be affected by changing its shape. Here we have the volume velocity functions in the half open tube um, for the uh, best resonating frequencies, the ones that create a standing wave. Um, the volume velocity function shows you how the uh, pressure changes at different locations in the case of the standing wave. So, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, F2 image in the middle, um, we have a uh, place at the left-hand side, the closed end of the tube, uh, where there's no pressure change, and also a location about two-thirds along the way of the tube, where there is no pressure change. So a standing wave within that tube, if you were to be able to measure the pressure inside the tube at that particular location, um, that would have uh, no pressure and no pressure change compared to atmospheric pressure. At the other extreme in the open end of the tube, or about a third of the way uh, into the tube, we have locations where there is maximum change in pressure um, from its highest level to its lowest level um, over time as the standing wave reverberates in the tube. So these locations are marked for uh, the standing waves for each of the formant frequencies. Uh, the first formant, which is the wave that has a wavelength that's four times the length of the tube. The second formant, which is the next odd multiple of that, three times that frequency. And the third formant, which is the next odd multiple, five times that frequency. For each of these standing waves, there is a volume velocity function that has points where there is minimum change in pressure and maximum change in pressure. The minimum change in pressure points are known as nodes, and the maximum change in pressure points are known as antinodes. The actual theory behind perturbation theory is that some sort of constriction or closure at one of those maximum locations will reduce the corresponding formant frequency. For example, if you were to make a constriction at the lips, like through a rounding or a bilabial closure, at that open end of the tube, that's a volume velocity maximum for all of the formants, and so that will cause all of the formants to be lowered. This appears to be a good prediction. For example, the formant transitions for a buh um, all come from a, a lower frequency up into the vowel, um, for example. Uh, and so it would appear that that lip closure at buh does have lower formants than uh, the ah vowel that follows it in our, like in our stylized uh, graphs. In addition, our rounded high back vowels have lower F1 and lower F2 than all of our other vowels. So once again, that constriction at the lips appears to be contributing to that low acoustics. As we apply to perturbation theory to the vocal tract, um, I have some images here on the right that take those uh, standing waves within the tubes again for each of the formants. Uh, first, second, and third. 
um, shows them in the half open tube where the standing wave is a little more straightforward to visualize uh, where there are minimum uh, locations those nodes maximum locations those anti nodes and then halfway between the min and max I've marked a, a zero on there um, as the place where you cross over from being closer to a node to closer to an anti node Um, as I mentioned, uh, we always have a volume velocity maximum, an anti-node point at the lips. So uh, if we do some sort of constriction or lip protrusion there, uh, that will cause the formants to be lowered. If we take that half open tube and uh, kind of map it on to a vocal tract, uh, as shown in the mid sagittal images here, uh, we can make some other predictions about how articulation is going to affect our formants. So, for example, um, for F1, uh, there's a, a max at the lips because there always is, and there's that kind of crossover point about halfway through the vocal tract, which would be somewhere around the velopharyngeal port. Um, any sort of constriction in the oral region then will be constricting uh, where there's a higher volume velocity where you'll be closer to that max and so that would lower the corresponding formant. Uh, so for example our high vowels like E and U have a lower F1 compared to our low vowels like A ah, and that is consistent with perturbation theory. If we look at um, the image for F2 with the um, uh, volume velocity function mapped onto the vocal tract, um, uh, we would have uh, constrictions at the lips or at the uh, alveolar ridge, like for a, a coronal consonant, uh, would be in the vicinity of one of those maxes. Um, and so that would lower the corresponding uh, formant, in this case the second formant. If we had a constriction near the back part of the hard palate and the soft palate, that's near a minimum, and that will have the opposite effect of raising a formant. These patterns are consistent with our transitions in the second formant frequency, uh, our labial and alveolar um, sounds um, have F2 transitions that um, go up into the vowel, uh, whereas our velar uh, sound has an F2 transition that goes downward uh, into the vowel. In the case of F3, things get a little bit more complicated because the standing wave um, uh, has more maxes and mins in it, so uh, finding particular articulatory locations can be a challenge. Constriction in the um, labial or dorsal region being near maximum points, whereas a constriction in the alveolar or palatal region is near a min point. Uh, and so formant transitions for the third formant, for example, um, would go from lower for the consonant to higher for the vowel um, for the labial and the velar. Um, but would go from higher for the consonant to lower for the vowel for the alveolar. Uh, as I mentioned in passing, um, if we have a constriction at a volume velocity minimum, we end up with a raising of a formant frequency rather than lowering it. So the volume velocity maximum and minimum, or the antinode and node positions, uh, have opposite effects on the formant, fre uh, formant frequencies. It's also the case that expansion of the vocal tract has the opposite effect as a constriction. So if we were to expand the vocal tract at a maximum, rather than lowering the formant, it would raise it. And if we were to expand the vocal tract at a minimum, that would uh, lower the formant rather than raise it. In those locations where the volume velocity uh, is halfway between a maximum and a minimum, uh, some sort of change in articulation will basically not affect the formant. We can apply perturbation theory to make predictions about um, speech sounds that we don't know anything about, like ones that are not in English. For example, the Danish language has front vowels that are rounded in addition to front vowels that are not rounded. Uh, the IPA symbol for a front rounded vowel uh, uses the letter Y, for example. 
for a rounded version of the high front vowel. We can make predictions about the effects on the formants and how that uh, Y IPA symbol would differ from the E vowel. Since the uh, location of the lips is a volume velocity maximum for all of the formant frequencies, that addition of lip rounding should lower the corresponding formants. So if we were to measure the E in Danish versus that front rounded vowel, we would expect to find lower formant frequencies for all three formants. Another example uh, is found in Arabic where they have two different sets of alveolar stops. Uh, one set that has a pharyngeal constriction in it that are called guttural consonants, uh, and uh, ones that don't have such a constriction, which makes them comparable to English. If we were to make a constriction in the pharynx, um, uh, we would find uh, potential changes in the formants or the formant transitions that we would see. Um, in particular, constricting in the pharynx um, is in the vicinity of a volume velocity minimum for the first formant. Um, and so that constriction would help raise the first formant. So we would find a uh, first formant transition for uh, this type of stop uh, to come from a higher value into the vowel rather than from a lower value. Um, the predictions for the second and third formants would be a little bit more uh, complicated, but if we make reference to our um, uh, perturbation theory uh, images here where the vocal tract is mapped on. The second formant has a volume velocity maximum in the vicinity of the pharynx, and so we would expect constriction there to lower that second formant frequency. For the third formant, it might depend a little bit on exactly where the um, uh, constriction took place, um, but if we take it kind of straight back from the um, uh, widest part of the tongue, we seem to be in the region of a minimum, and so that would have an effect of raising the third formant frequency. So in summary, given the application of an articulation, either a constriction or an expansion, the location of that constriction or expansion in the vocal tract um, has predictable effects on the resulting formant frequencies knowledge of these patterns might be useful in uh, guiding coaching for uh, children with articulatory difficulties. Um, if they're producing unexpected formant values, uh, you can uh, try to make adjustments to their articulation to um, move those formant values toward uh, the appropriate level.